Welcome to another virtual virtuoso with the Cheyenne Symphony Orchestra. I'm William Intrilligator, music director, conductor. Welcome. Joining me today is one of our principal bassoons, Melanie Fisher. Welcome, Melanie. Hi, it's great to be here. Yeah, it's really great to have a chance to see you, to talk to you, and to get to hear you play. And Melanie and her other bassoonist in the orchestra, Tom, have an unusual situation where they share the principal bassoon chair. So they're both the co-principals, and they just choose tell us how you do that I mean you just choose which concerts you want or <laughs> how does that work so basically and um, traditionally we've alternated every other concert mm -hmm. just because it works out well that way unless one of us has a conflict um, I happen to play in the Greeley Philharmonic as well and he plays in the Fort Collins Symphony and every once in a while there's some other conflict so we'll we'll choose based on that sometimes yeah. And you guys seem to have a really great working relationship and you each bring something special and and your own special artistry when you sit in the principal chair and the second chair. There's artistry involved in both, of course. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I remember one of my fondest memories of the Cheyenne Symphony Orchestra in my experiences was my audition concert when we did Scheherazade. And I will never forget your absolutely gorgeous bassoon solos in Scheherazade, Melanie. That oh, was that really, I was so impressed with you from like day one, I have yeah. to say. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was, it's been great. And that was 12 years ago. So I wonder oh, how, how long have you been in the Cheyenne Symphony? So I started playing um, the 20, 20, 2000, I guess, 2001 season. Mm -hmm. um, Unfortunately, the former co-principal bassoonist passed away, and so they had called me in. I had just moved to the area, and they called me in to sub and fill in um, that season. And so then I took the audition officially in 2002, okay. and that's when I became a, an official member. So, yeah. Well, that is so great. Wow, that's sad, those circumstances. Yeah, it was very lucky. Yeah. We were lucky that you just moved into the area. Yeah, and it's it's that. me, but a, a, un, you know, really sad situation for Tom, especially. He had played with Jeff Bach for years, so. Oh gosh, yeah. wow! And then that means that you're coming up. This will be your twentieth season with us, not officially mm -hmm. uh, after you won your audition, but since you started playing with us in two thousand. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. That's and started great. playing in the Greeley Philharmonic at that same time. They had an audition as well in two thousand. So it was the year you know, before I started playing with Shining and then I started there, so. Amazing, so 20 years. Yeah, in yeah, yeah. That's amazing. So yeah. back up and tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from originally, Melanie? So I grew up in Finley, Ohio, it's Northwest Ohio. And um, I've always had music a part of my life because my mom and dad are both very musical. My mom was a music teacher. She taught kindergarten through eighth grade until she retired. And my dad always sang in choirs, and he had a barbershop quartet that he sang in. And so I've been surrounded by music. I started on the piano with my mom as my teacher, and then I changed to flute, even though I wanted to play the oboe. My sister played the oboe, oh, and so I love the oboe. But <laughs> I started on flute because she started on flute, actually, so I had her flute. Uh -huh. And then um, when I was 13, I guess it was seventh grade, um, the band director at the time, Mr. Kondik, had approached my mom, and I think it was a little bit of a conspiracy to try to get me to play the bassoon, because honestly, I had no idea what a bassoon was at that point. <laughs> I didn't even know what it looked like. And I remember my mom showed me either a picture, probably, because we didn't have internet or anything, you know? Oh, uh, yeah. And um, I was like, that looks weird, you know? <laughs> it was intriguing, though. And so I was like, okay, I'll try it, you know, why not? So they actually ordered a... Um, a short reach bassoon for me because they measured my hands and apparently my hands were pretty small for the bassoon. Mm -hmm. And so they ordered a Fox Model 51, which is a short reach. I didn't so even know that. That. <laughs> that is so cool. You started yeah. on that. Yeah. And um, what happened when you first started playing it? I mean, what did you know right away or did it take some time for you to warm up to it? You know, I really 
I really enjoyed learning the bassoon just because it was new and challenging and different, but I don't think I really officially fell in love with it probably until high school. And then I um, was asked to play a, a piece with the band as a soloist my senior year. And wow. so that was kind was of an honor. Honor. And it was fun. Yeah. And honestly, though, um, as far as wanting to play professionally, I didn't really um, start thinking, cons considering that seriously until I was in college, probably about my sophomore year. I um I did a I actually won a, con a competition a concerto competition um, for the Marion Philharmonic in Indiana, and so um yeah Neil Gittleman was the conductor there and I know yeah. Neil well he was also of course he still is also at the Dayton Philharmonic yeah. that's what I understand yeah mm -hmm. so um yeah so the rest is history I I took lessons um actually at Ball State University because where I went to school there was no bassoon professor oh and so, which, which college did you go to I actually went to a very small school Taylor University which no one's ever heard of really okay. But um, my boyfriend at the time and I went there kind of together and about halfway through, I considered majoring in music and I was thinking of transferring to Bowling Green State University where my, my bassoon teacher was at the time, but I didn't. I stayed there and graduated from there. So I had to go to Ball State to take bassoon lessons throughout that four year period. Oh, wow. What, what was that commute like? Was it very far from Taylor? It wasn't far at all. It was only about 25 miles. and. So yeah, so a friend of mine and I used to drive down there together because she played the bassoon as well. Yeah. And we studied with Homer Pence and Keith Swagger there. Oh, nice. But, yeah. I'm so impressed that you weren't yet like super officially into like majoring in music and going into bassoon, but yet you won this concerto competition of this, you know, professional regional orchestra. That's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. It was very nerve wracking at the time because I had to, you know, play in front of all these people on a stage in a concert hall, and yeah. but it was an amazing experience. So. Oh, good. Did you do the Mozart or? I actually played the Weber. Um, yeah. Yeah. Fun showy and fun, right? <laughs> yeah, and I only played the third movement. It was that was how they set it up was just for one movement. So yeah, that's yeah. what happened with me. I once won a concerto competition on oboe and I got to do just the first movement of the Mozart. Oh, yeah, that was yeah. Fun. yeah. Well that's so great. So then what happened after that? How did you get to the front range? And by the way, it's interesting that there are a lot of people with Ohio connections in the Cheyenne area and in the yeah. front range area. There's a lot of Former Ohioans, if that's yeah, what you say. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Well, um, after I graduated from college, I didn't have a job yet. And so <laughs> I decided to attend this bassoon symposium um, of John Miller. I don't know if I know oh. you have a background in the Minnesota Orchestra. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so I moved on a whim after he had heard me play. And he's like, well, what are you doing with the bassoon? And I was like, well, I don't know. You know? And he's like, I think you have a lot of potential. And he's like, why don't you come study with me? And so I completely changed my plans. I had, I had planned to move to Indianapolis with a friend. And instead, I packed up my car and moved to Minnesota to St. Paul. And I actually lived with a, a bassoonist. And um, I lived there for about three years and studied with John Miller there. Wow, yeah, John Miller is an amazing bassoonist from the Minnesota Orchestra. And I didn't know that. Um, that you lived in the Twin Cities. I was there for seven years. Yeah. I think you may have been there around the same time that you were there. Oh, I don't know. I'm a little older, I think. I don't think you're like the same age, I think. I was there from 94 to 97. Oh, you're right. We were there at the same time. I was there 93 to 2000 in the Twin Cities. Isn't Cities. that funny? Isn't yeah. that funny? I'm sorry. I've been played remember. at the University of Minnesota on several occasions um, because I think at the time they had some issues and they needed some extra help. Yeah. And so I was able to fill in and play oh, in the orchestra gosh. a few times. <laughs> so funny. Yeah. I don't think we ever worked together there, though, did we? You know, I was wondering if we did. I know I played the Dvorak Wind Serenade one time, and I don't remember who the conductor was. But I don't know. That was um, with all the University of Minnesota people. I remember <laughs> that. I kind of remember that performance. I thought maybe, did I perform on oboe in that? Like second oboe? You know, I don't 
I don't really know. <laughs> so funny. Yeah. We might have played together before we didn't even know it. Yeah. yeah, right. That's so funny. Wow. So then, um, did you get like a master's in bassoon there? And actually, no, I didn't. I just went there and studied, and then. Um, Fortunately, I was able to attend um, the Sarasota Music Festival for three years while I was during that time. And I got to play with amazing people like Anthony McGill. Wow. Um, we were in a quintet together in, at the oh Sarasota my. Music Festival. Wow. And then um, I took an audition for the Civic Orchestra of Chicago yeah. in 97. And I was there 97 and 98 in that group in Chicago for a oh, year. Congratulations. That's a really big deal. That's like, it was, really, like, it was an amazing experience. So. Yeah. Where you, you're mentored by the Chicago Symphony and uh, it's like basically one of the top or if not the top postgraduate conservatory kind of program. Post it, was, it was incredible. I was very nervous because I was surrounded by all, by all these incredible musicians and got to perform with Pierre Boulez and oh. Danny Barenbaum. It, it was just- Oh, that's amazing. amazing. I mean, wow. it was it was incredible. So, uh -huh. Yeah, well, just one year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were so young still, yeah. So yeah. then how did you end up coming down to the Front Range area? So after that, um, my husband, um, he is a foot doctor and he got a residency in Salt Lake City was where we were first in that area. So I got to play while I was there too. I was just really lucky to get to the right place at the right time. Well, that's and, a good um, thing about bassoon. You know, they need, we always need good bassoonists. Yeah, <laughs> true. <laughs> and um, so after that, he um, got a job in Fort Collins, which is what brought us to the area in about 2000 or 99-ish. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so I just happened to come at a time when there were a couple auditions and I got in the scene. So I've been playing in the area ever since. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. And then when I joined the orchestra, I had the impression that you were actually living in Cheyenne at that point. Is that true? Was Did your husband's practice move up to Cheyenne or did he have yeah. enough business up here or something? Yeah. Yeah, so actually he opened his own um, practice. So he, he still works all by himself. So it's, it's always challenging because of that. But yeah. He um he opened a practice in Laramie originally, oh. and I had a job as a pharmacy technician in Windsor, Colorado. So Cheyenne was halfway for both of us at the time, and this was before kids. Right. And so we lived in Cheyenne for almost 11 years. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Tell us about your kids. So my oldest is, he, he's 14, and um, my youngest is nine. He just turned nine. So they keep me on my toes. <laughs> yes. Busy, yes. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. And um, so, and then some people watching this who are regular, you know, Cheyenne Symphony goers living in Cheyenne, maybe they would recognize you from your time when you worked as a pharm pharmacy technician. Tell us a little bit about that, if you don't mind. Yeah, so I actually became a pharmacy technician way back in 1994 when I moved to Minnesota, to St. Paul, because I had to pay my rent somehow. Right. And so that's what I, I did, and I've been doing it ever since. Wow. And thankfully, I've been able to um, provide health insurance for our family since my husband's self-employed. Right. So that's why I kind of have to do it, too, to keep, to keep that going for my family. So... Yeah. yeah. But I worked in Cheyenne actually at the Safeway on South Greeley Highway for yeah. almost 10 years. Yeah. I know. That's what I was going to say. I've, I remember that you were at that Safeway, and I think many of the people watching might, you know, we all know yep. about the Safeway yep. on South Greeley Highway. So, yep. that's yeah, it's a great community. It was it's a nice time when I lived there, and lots of friendly people. And we yeah. really appreciate everything that all the people do coming to our concerts and it's great. It's great community in Cheyenne. There's, there's the spirit of the people. I mean, it, it's amazing what all they do in Cheyenne. Yeah. You know, it's incredible. Yeah. And like frontier days and everything. But yeah. 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 It's, it's so do you have any favorite like bassoon stories or bassoon moments or some experience that really made you like know that the bassoon, playing the bassoon was something really special you didn't want to ever give up or you know, anything like that that you want willing to share? 
I well, think five. <laughs> I did have an experience where I got to play in the Sydney Opera House. <laughs> wow. and this was when I was in college also, about my sophomore year. This was about the same time I was considering majoring in music. And um, I got to travel with a band from my hometown of Finley, Ohio, to the Sydney area. And we got to perform. It was a competition. It was like an international band competition. And so we got to perform on the stage of the Sydney Opera House. And oh, I just remember being in awe of, you know, the building and what it would be like to perform in a place, you know, like that on a regular basis. Or, you know, I just got inspired by that. That is so yeah. great. Wow. But I think really it was probably the concerto competition and studying with my teacher, Robert Moore, was the one who I think inspired me. Um, Oh, to pursue music he's like you should major in music <laughs> so but that, um, i've always had music in my life at least i didn't major in music but um at least i've been able to play and i love that so well it's amazing that you're able to play at such a high professional level and that you also have all these other pursuits and careers and majors from college and everything like that you're just so multi-talented it's amazing <laughs> okay. um and you mentioning your teacher um, Professor Moore is a great segue into the piece that you're going to be performing today. Tell us a little bit about that. So I chose the piece by Richard Chiafari, and it's called the bassoon. Oh, it's called the Sonatina for bassoon and piano by Richard Chiafari, and he was a professor um, at Bowling Green State University, where my bassoon teacher was at the time. I lived in Finley, Ohio, and Bowling Green was only about a half hour from there, so I used to go up there to study with him. And anyway, he wrote it, and I just think it's a beautiful piece, and it shows the great qualities of the bassoon, um, both like the lyrical singing parts of the bassoon, and then um, kind of the jollity and fun that a lot of people think of when they think of a bassoon. <laughs> a little bit of that in there too, and real lyrical parts that I love. So that's why oh. I chose it. And, and it was actually dedicated to my former bassoon professor, which was Robert Moore. So, yeah, yeah, so great. So it was written for him. Did you actually study the piece with him or get to work with the composer at all on it? Or? You know, I don't think I did with him, but I did take lessons briefly with um, Richard Chiafari's wife. Um, just one summer, um, I studied with her for a few lessons. And um, so there's a connection. Also a bassoonist. He was also a bassoonist, yeah. Oh, neat. Wow. So, um, and you were telling me before we were recording that Chiafari is also still alive and still active and people can find him on online. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I noticed he has a YouTube channel and a lot of his works are on there. And um, I did Google this bassoon piece too. I was just curious if, it, if there was a recording out there and there's, there's a, um, a recording of that. So I listened to that. I can't remember the, the guy's name. It was he, I think he's um, a professor of bassoon in Ohio as well oh, that, re that recorded the piece. I can't think of his name. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's so neat. Wow. And then the piece, like a lot of sauna, sonatas or sonatinas, have, has three movements, right? It does, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. We're going to hear all three. Yeah, so the first movement is um, just kind of it's just a fun lyrical it has both lyrical and kind of i don't know how to describe it it's just a fun movement and then it goes into the second and third movement and the second movement is more of the kind of more passionate lyrical style mm -hmm. kind of a little bit reflective i don't know and then it leads right into the third movement which is a lot more peppy and fun and this, it kind of shows off the characteristics of the bassoon, I think. So, that's yeah. great. Do you know about what year it was written? Hmm, that's a very good question. I don't, but I would assume, you know, I'm not positive. Maybe I, like the I, 80s or 90s or something? I would like think that. 80s probably is my guess. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Does it have any unusual techniques or demands for the bassoon, sort of modernistic things of it, or is it pretty traditional also in its harmonies and things? It's pretty traditional. It's not, um, a lot of more contemporary works are a little more out there. And um, this one's very, um, 
it's easy to listen to for I think anyone would enjoy it. Yeah. Good. Beautiful. That's great. Yeah. And the whole thing is just 10 or 11 minutes in all three movements, right? So yep. we're going to hear all three. You said there's a little break after the first movement, but mm -hmm. then the second and third movements go right into each other. So people might think it's one. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the fun situation that you, about your accompanist, um, your collaborator and your pianist for this. Yeah, so about a year ago, I found out our new neighbors, um, literally right next door to our house, they both studied the piano at the University of Northern Colorado. And um, so I just decided when I um, thought about performing something, I was like, you know, it'd be really fun to collaborate with someone since we haven't been able to do that. And, um, I asked her and she hadn't played in about 20 years, you know, as far as chamber music and that kind of thing. And so her name is Amanda Gorelli and she plays with me in this piece. It was really fun. Fantastic. Is there anything else that you want to share about Amanda? Is there any other thing that she does or um, I don't know, is there any other thing that we need to mention about her? Um, she has a beautiful piano <laughs> that we were able to use at her house. Oh, and nice. Her, it was recorded in her house. Uh-huh. Yeah, right. we recorded it in her house next door. And um, she's, it's great to have them as neighbors because they love classical music. And that's not something that every neighbor understands, you know, so it's kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And um, her son plays with my, my youngest. So oh, they, nice. yeah, it's been fun. And how did you handle the social distancing and everything? Did you, I mean, obviously you can't wear a mask while you play the bassoon. Right. So Just she actually wore a mask every time we rehearsed together. And she actually wore a mask when um, we were just discussing the piece. And um, my son actually helped record the piece because he's got some equipment that he paid for himself. And um, he wore a mask as well. But I didn't just because it's a little hard to deal with reeds and everything. And yeah. so... Yeah. Wonderful. Well, uh, is there anything else you want to share before we go right into the performance? Um, no, I think that's about it. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, then here's Melanie Fisher and Amanda Gorelli playing the Chiafari Sonatina for bassoon and piano. Enjoy. Thank you.
Brava, Melanie, and also to Amanda too. I haven't heard it yet, I have to be honest, but I'm very excited to hear it when it's broadcast live and um, to get to know the music of a composer I wasn't familiar with. Chiafari, I love that name. Yes. That's a <laughs> ring to it. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your musical talent with us and for introducing us to, um, you know, new music. I think that's a wonderful thing. I'm sure with the bassoon, you're always looking for new pieces uh, and the, probably the r repertoire for the bassoon is expanding a lot now and mm -hmm. that's exciting. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You know, also, Melanie, I wanted to thank you for being one of our, you know, frontline heroes. Being a pharmacy technician, I imagine that you've been in work consistently during the pandemic. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's definitely been challenging. Um, we were really, really, really busy there for quite a while, um, right when all this media craze hit with COVID-19. And... Um, of course, it's challenging. We have to wear a mask all day long, and that gets, you know, exhausting. Um, but it's essential work, and I'm, I'm very lucky to have that job. And I, that way, I'm able to have health insurance for my family. And my husband, actually, um, he's a foot doctor, and he works all by himself in his own practice um, in Cheyenne, actually, two oh, days a week. Yeah. Oh. So he's up there on Thursdays and Fridays, and um, his his business is called Advanced Foot Care, okay. and then he also works down in Fort Collins as well. So, which is why we came back to Fort Collins because he's working down here too by himself. Sure. What's so, his full name? It's Timothy Fisher. Okay, right. Yeah. Yep. So, what happened with his work during the time when everything was shut down and people were staying at home and everything? So unfortunately, um, his is not considered an essential um, working really? situation because he's a foot doctor. Mm -hmm. So um, if someone had an infection or something like that, he would be able to treat them in person. But otherwise, he had to stay at home. And so basically, he didn't work for about two months. Oh my and um, he was able to do a few telemedicine visits, but that's a little difficult with feet <laughs> on a, a telemedicine visit. So... Yeah, so it's been challenging. Wow. Oh, so yeah. in a sense, it was really lucky for your family that your work was steady during Yeah, that. and thankfully I was able to pick up more hours during that time because we <laughs> need to pay our mortgage, of course. Yeah. So, were, yeah. you, were you concerned, especially in those first days of like self-quarantine, you know, self-isolation and stuff to go yeah. out and work? I mean, that's... Yeah, it was a little bit scary because... Um, well, at first we didn't even have masks. And um, finally uh, we got the KN95 masks in the pharmacy. And so then we felt a lot more protected and we wanted to protect other people as well um, because we have interactions all day long, hundreds of people you know, that are coming to pick up their prescriptions. Yeah. And so for a while we, we kept the gate down in the pharmacy, which helped a little bit, but um, they, they didn't really like that because it made it look like we were closed. Yeah, <laughs> and right. We had to put that back up, but I felt we were protecting each other that mm -hmm. way with it down. It was more like a, looked like a movie theater, you know, like where you, uh, <laughs> like, like, I'll take that under, <laughs> under the gate there. <laughs> but, yeah. But now we're just working in the open air with our masks. You are. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because I know in a lot of, um, you know, pharmacies and in supermarkets and they still have the, like a clear plexiglass shield and stuff, but. Yeah, uh, I wish we had more protection for both our customers and ourselves, but yeah. unfortunately, yeah, we're just out there. <laughs> In the first days um, when people were told to stay at home, was there like a run on the pharmacy where everybody tried to get their prescriptions filled yeah. the next, you know, weeks or months? Oh, so it was, was it the normal or? Yes, it was really, really busy for, I would say the first couple of weeks when the actual quarantine, when they were, you know, the stay at home order, um, everyone panicked and I watched all of it, you know, because we're in the pharmacy, you can see the whole grocery store. Yeah. And um, in fact, we're positioned right by the toilet paper aisle. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so, all that. so we were always like joking, like, okay, it's going to be gone by 11 a.m. today. And it was, I mean, it was, it was insane. Wow. So, yeah. Every day they'd restock and it'd be gone before me. Yes. And yeah. then they couldn't restock it for wow. weeks and weeks and weeks. It's been, and hand sanitizer was, it wasn't available. Yeah. Soap and everything. It was, you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, rubbing alcohol hard. is still hard to find. It's Clorox wipes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> over. I know it's, it's, yeah. we've evolved, 
but it, we're not past it. You know, it's so exactly. weird. It feels like when we talk about those early days, it, it feels like we're talking about a time when we were all kind of in the dark, you know, because right. there were no masks. Like you said, there was no testing even. You couldn't even get masks. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy. So now at least we have masks and testing and we're yeah. a little more savvy. But, you know, then there's still a lot of people who, who choose not to follow some of the guidelines. And yes. You know, I'm grateful that you and so many like you kept the, you know, the everything moving ahead. You know, people who work in the supermarkets, people who work like you, like you in the pharmacy, mm -hmm. um, allowed us to continue to survive and, and even possibly thrive during that difficult time, this difficult time. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of healthcare heroes out there, that's for sure. Yeah, yes. I'm not saying that I'm one of them, but I, I do provide a, a good service for people that need their medication, so. Yes, yeah. thank you for everything you're doing, Melanie. Thank you. I forgot to mention some of the other musical activities that you do in the Front Range. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I've been playing here since about 2000, and so I'm a member of the Greeley Philharmonic, and I play second bassoon there with Chuck Hansen, who he's been there longer than I have. So it's been a wonderful experience with him. And then I sub whenever people need me, I fill in and I played, I played in the Fort Collins Symphony quite a bit, the Boulder Philharmonic, and I've gotten to play with the Colorado Symphony quite a bit in the last few years. And it's been just an incredible experience playing there as well. I bet. Yeah. Have there been some musical highlights where there's some piece, really exciting pieces that they did at the Yeah, college? so the first piece I ever played with them was Mahler 7. Oh and my gosh. Yes, it's incredible. Yeah. Wow. I got to play under um, Andrew Litton, who oh, was the yeah. music conductor at the time. And there's a there's a third bassoon solo in it, so it was it was very exciting. And oh, how my wonderful. parents got to come from Ohio to hear that. So oh, great! Was, yeah, Mahler Seven is amazing. Yeah, it's an incredible yeah. piece. That finale is just over the top. <laughs> Unbelievable! Yeah. yeah. And then I've played several times, you know, since then. Yeah. But um, most recently, I was supposed to be playing um, a bunch this past spring when all COVID nineteen hit. And um, I actually had a rehearsal on March 12th, which was, at that point, everything was already closing down everywhere. And the Colorado Symphony was hanging on as long as they could. And so we, we met for that rehearsal. I was going to play second on a family concert. And um, anyway, so I went to that rehearsal. And then the very next day, I was supposed to go for a rehearsal and a concert um, with the music of Queen. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, fun. <laughs> which would have been really fun, but... Um, and then the family concert would have been that following Sunday. And I was also supposed to play Mahler 7, um, or not Mahler 7, sorry, Mahler 9 <laughs> with oh. them in May. And so I, it's really All just- All those got canceled, the Queen, the family concert and Mahler 9, you were gonna do with yeah. the Carl Symphony and they all got canceled? They all got canceled. Oh, yeah. I'm sad, I'm sorry. In <laughs> fact, I was, I was at my job, my pharmacy technician job, um, dressed in black because I had to work in the morning and then I was going to go on Friday the 13th, March 13th. Wow, I was yeah. going to work in the morning, go down for a rehearsal for Queen, the music of Queen yeah. <laughs> concert. And then that concert was supposed to be that night, March 13th. But it, we, I literally got a phone call that morning that they finally were shutting everything down. So oh, it's terrible for all these musicians out of work everywhere. Yeah, it's really sad. Yeah. Wow, Melanie, I am so impressed with you're able to do so many things. I mean, you, you're, you've got your pharmacy job, you've got your orchestra performances in both Cheyenne and Greeley and places like the Colorado Symphony where it sounds like you've made a huge impression on the people there that they keep rehiring you, bravo. It's been um, so they get to play. So. And then the, you know, being with your family and, and doing all that, it's just, just wonderful. We're so lucky that we have so many talented people in the Cheyenne Symphony Orchestra. And I'm just really glad that we have this opportunity for people to get to know you better and to really appreciate all that you bring to the orchestra. Well, thanks for having me. It's been really fun talking with you. And I really appreciate all of the patrons and the sponsors in the Cheyenne Symphony and we couldn't do it without any of them. And so with all of them, we need all of them. And we yeah. all of them. We're very fortunate to have that support. You're right. And I think what they know is that 
they they recognize the dedication, artistry, and sacrifice of our musicians. And I think the the performances are, you know, they're so at a, such a higher level than one might expect in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And yeah. that, they're really proud of it. I think they want to keep it going. I, I, I don't want to speak for them, but that's the impression I've gotten, what I've been told from some, some of my friends in Cheyenne. They're, so, they're also they're down really to earth. Great. You could talk to any of them. And it's just know. a great community. Yeah, it really is a great community. It really is. Well, Melanie, thank you for being such a great part of the Cheyenne Symphony Orchestra. It's, it's mm -hmm. really a pleasure working with you every time. And this has been really fun. We got to know your spirit and your smile and your music and your background and about your family. And it really means a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. All right. Good night, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to another Virtual Virtuoso. <laughs>